Hi, Michael. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm all right. I'm all right. How's all right. You no better than all right. <laughs> no, I'm doing great. You just published a book. You should be happy. Or you're, you're, you know, by the time this airs, you will have just published a book. As we speak, you are in that period that authors refer to as the calm before the calm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Before you find that you're doomed to disappear forever. <laughs> no, I'm sure it'll go better than that. Uh, so you are, well, first, I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You're Michael Powell, well-known columnist uh, for the New York Times sports page. In fact, you are uh, you have a very distinguished pedestal, the Sports of the Times column, previously the home of no less than Red Smith, uh, the famed uh, Red Smith, and a, and a couple of successors since that. Um, and uh, you've written a book called... Canyon Dreams, a basketball season on the Navajo Nation. Here's what it looks like for people who are watching and not just listening. There you go. Uh, um, very handsome. Uh, and I want to talk both about the book and about uh, your life as a sports writer. They're mm -hmm. certainly uh, very closely related. Um, I mean, first, just before we get into your life as a sports writer, just quickly about the book. Um, is Canyon Dreams a, a, an allusion to the documentary Hoop Dreams? No, actually, it, it, it isn't, uh, though I suppose that 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 would work. Uh, no, in the, in, the, in the nature, and you've written a few books, I mean, the nature of those things, I was trying to just, you know, sort of free associate ideas. Mm -hmm. And it a, a big part of the book, I mean, I, as I like to say, it's a, I hope it's a, a sports book that's not really a sports book. I mean, that you know, it certainly I, is. Yes. It, as a window, a lens onto this this vast place and this really kind of unique culture. So one of the one of the big things that all of these uh, young men that I was dealing with, you know, wrestled with was this, in a sense, their canyon dreams. And in fact, they would walk through canyons. I mean, that's a big part of the culture, right. and try to figure out their relationship to this vast reservation to the outside world, do they leave? If they leave, which most of them know they need to at some point, can they ever truly come back? So anyway, it, mm -hmm. it, it seemed to me that the sense of a, you know, of, of dreaming, of daydreaming, of, you know, wrestling right. with this kind of something. Right. I mean, of course, the reason I thought of uh, Hoop Dreams, I mean, this is about a high school, this is about high school basketball players, a particular uh, high school in Chinle, small town, um, on the Navajo Reservation, the uh, Hoop Dreams is a documentary about uh, high school basketball players um, from the inner city. Yeah, uh, it's a brilliant the, the, one. Yeah, it's a great documentary. Yeah. Uh, the the stories are very different. Uh, although one one, I, I mean, a couple of things they have in common is the, the players in Hoop Dreams are from uh, lower income areas. Uh, that have, you know, their, their share of social problems. Uh, there, there is a certain incentive to, to leave, uh, you know, the, 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 the milieu they were born into. And in their case, they're, they're highly recruited, uh, at the prep school level. And that may be their ticket out. They hope to get basketball scholarships and, and, and so on. Uh, so there are lots of, and that's a critical difference with the res, because mm -hmm. on the res... We should say res is short for reservation, right? R-E-Z is the spelling, yeah. Yes, and it's, and it's, it's a, a word used by the Navajo all the time. Right. But on the reservation, on the res, most of these kids are not going to go... They're, ne they're not going to go on to D1 top basketball programs in college. They might be able to play community college. So it's, it's a somewhat... I mean, there's a lo the love of the game is very similar. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you know, kind of the relationship to their long-term dreams is quite different than mm -hmm. the, the documentary. That's right. That's right. Um, they are... 
for the most part, not not players who who have a chance of playing high level college basketball, for example. Whereas uh, in hoop dreams, they did. Although they're, you know, it's a pretty high level of, of ball. I actually looked them up on YouTube. L- looked at a little Chenley basketball. You know, <laughs> it's good. Good compare. I mean, I played basketball in high school. By my lights, they seem pretty good. Oh, they are. Oh, no. They, and, and, and trust I played some high school basketball, and I don't think I could run with them. So that that's – no, they, they're they good ball players. Yeah. So um, let's let's uh, back up and talk a little bit about your, your sports writing generally because this is – it is very much – it's not quite an extension of your column, but, but the set of – I mean, just as you said, it's not just a book about sports. Your column is often not just a column about sports, or at least – it's a column that gets into the political and cultural dimensions of of sports, right? I mean, sometimes right. no, that's, sometimes yeah. it almost seems like a meta sports column, and sometimes <laughs> it seems more like a sports column. But that's that's kind of part of your mission, and and it, and it goes back before you, right? That, that the column has long been more than a conventional sports column. Is that right? Yes, and I think it kind of depends on the writer. But I think if I think of somebody like, well, actually, Red Smith, but also <clears throat> um, George Vesey, who did it really immediately before I took over. I mean, George also mm-hmm. had, and, and and like both of us had a, <laughs> if you will, a career outside of sports writing. And and you, he was and I am encouraged to bring that to writing about sports and 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 the issues around sports. Mm-hmm. So you'll write about uh, issues raised by the commercialization of s- sports, questions about the exploitation of players, you know, indifference to the long term health of players, sometimes whether whether college players should get a piece of the action and and. Uh, all, yeah, all, all that race, of, yeah. class. I mean, that, that that's yes. I, I like to think. I mean, those are the things that interest me, and and I think I hope as a writer um, that if it interests you, and if you feel passionate about, it, if I feel passionate about it, I can convey that you know mm-hmm. to the reader. And you you didn't come from a straight sports writing background, right? You'd done various kinds of uh, writing other than other than sports yes. writing. Yeah, the vast majority of my career, I mean, I've done poverty reporting. I covered Marion Barry. I covered Rudy Giuliani, God help me, and mm-hmm. him. Um, you know, national politics, national economics. And then I had a, immediately before I started the sports column, I did a local uh, column in the New York area, kind of on politics and society i guess Mm -hmm. uh called the gotham column so i've done a lot of other things okay so this broad in sports well we all we all have some form of imposter syndrome but this seems like you've got a reasonably uh good you know a pretty uh enviable uh version of it the um so this book was a uh, is a natural for you i mean it, it, it involves social cultural Issues and then basketball is your your biggest passion in sports, at least as far as, far as your own personal involvement goes. Yeah, I would say so. It's the sport that most moves me. Yeah. yeah. What is it? What is it about the game? You know, I think I grew up in New York City, and it so well as I was going to file. Well, anyway, I'll finish my thoughts. So there, it truly, you know, it was the city game. It was. It felt for, frankly, you know, a white kid growing up in New York in the 70s, uh, a way of, um, you know, kind of making, you know, there's, there's a, I mean, it's cliched, but there is a jazz quality to it. And it, and it kind of, it felt like it, you know, was, was tr- that it injected the city and injected me into the city in a way, Uh, you know, kind of cross racially, cross culturally. Um, And I just, I love the kind of the improvisational nature of it. I've Mm -hmm. never cared. I certainly played some football, but I didn't really care for it. I mean, the things that people, and I get it, that they groove on, which is kind of the strategy and the, uh, the kind of almost, you know, Roman, style uh uh you know military formations just didn't 
do anything for me. And I mm-hmm. like, as I say, I like the improvisational quality. Yeah, no, the, the, the ratio of structure to improvisation is reminiscent of jazz. And by the way, if you ever actually, I've done this, if you ever actually, uh, turn the volume down while watching sports and play various kinds of music to it. Basketball works with jazz in a way that other sports don't. I mean, there, oh, that's, that's great. there yeah. seems to be a synchronization. Um, I mean, I did this when I was, this was probably in college, and there may have been circumstances that made me more attuned to <laughs> correlations uh, than I might have otherwise been. Uh, but, I can imagine. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that was the case. It wouldn't have worked with football. There did seem to be a real a real kind of synchronization of, of sound and... Uh, and video, and then there's the um, the whole thing of pickup basketball, which is a fascinating subculture, a way to meet people very unlike you. It's a it's a real, it can you know be a real weird little bridge builder, and and a, and a real uh, a real avenue of anthropology. You played a lot of pickup ball in New York. Oh yeah, and in fact that that was exactly the case. It was interesting. Growing up, there was this. <laughs> I remember this guy Mel who would sleep in cars. He was a junkie and a drunk. And as a little kid, we just knew him because we'd see him near, you know, the the misshapen field that we played softball on. And when I started to play basketball, all of a sudden he shows up there and you realize this guy's a serious baller. I mean, he was the king of the court that I played at. And it was a fascinating, you know, so this guy who was, as I say, clearly a junkie, clearly a drunk, sleeping cars, and yet he'd show up there. Anyway, it was just a, it was a yeah. fascinating, fascinating bit of alchemy. And it, uh, and, you know, and, yeah. well, that just reminds me of a kind of the, it's not quite the inverse, but I, I, when I lived in Brooklyn and the, I was still playing in the early eighties, although reaching the twilight of my career. And, uh, I played pickup ball with a guy and, and then um, I one day uh, uh, a garbage truck went by and he was like working on it. And I got the impression he was avoiding eye contact because I had encountered him in an arena where his stature was at least the equal of mine. And I uh, think yes. he felt right. like, you know, he probably knew I had some kind of white collar job and it was it was it was weird. But but it's a great equalizer. I, I mean, um, or at least it inverts the uh, it can invert the social order. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Uh, and that's what I got. And then that was also a lot of fun. Okay. So we referred to, um, we talked about the, the ratio of structure to improvisation. That can vary. There are different kinds of basketball. There's like white boy basketball, which stereotypically would be like a lot of passing, working around for the open shot methodically. Inner city ball would be looser. More about one-on-one matchups, driving, the, you know, and so on. These are the stereotypes, at least. And then there's this thing called res ball, apparently, and uh, meaning the, the, the reservation. Yes. And, and that has more than one connotation. I mean, it's, it sounds like it's partly just about the whole phenomenon of basketball being this passion. I mean, high school basketball, I went to high school in Texas. High school basketball here is what, uh, in the Navajo Nation, is what football was Absolutely. in Texas. Yes, yes, very and much so, so. So it's about, res ball alludes to that, but then there's also a kind of a, it has other connotations, including a kind of style of play. A very, yeah, it's this fast, it's this very fast, elusive, sort of sneaker squeaking style where it's, it's you know, run, 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 pass, pass, pass. Um, it's, if you will, it's a little bit like the the old Phoenix Suns when they had Steve Nash, or I suppose a mm-hmm. little bit like, I mean, the Warriors, right? I mean, and that there was this very, this big emphasis when played well on passing and and just moving all the time. And that does find its roots very much in native culture but certainly in the culture of the southwest where distance running is probably the other i mean there's sort of three passions if you will there's rodeo basketball distance running and i'm talking about for the natives Mm -hmm. and the distance running is is huge and they the best distance runners in the southwest come out of the reservations and 
so they, if you will, that, that, that kind of plays well with basketball because when they get out there, it's just running, running, running. It's not quite the quickness, the explosive quickness of the urban game, right? right. It's, but it is just constant movement. And in fact, I, a long time ago, I did a, a, I hung out with a very well coached team in the Bronx. And I kept thinking, you know, it'd be, it'd be a lot of fun to kind of see them play each other because mm-hmm. they were both very well coached in their own style of basketball. Hmm. So on the one hand, I gather there's, there are, there's a, there are fa- a lot of fast breaks. And for people who aren't basketball fans, that means you try to get the ball down court before the defense has time to set up and, 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 and exploit that. Uh, so there's, there's that. But on the other hand, even once your offense, if your set is sets up, it's very fluid and dynamic. Yes. It's, it's, it, ideally it's kind of constant moving and cuts, um, and right working. So it, it's a very fluid, I, I guess I keep coming back to fluid. It's like yeah. watching a river, you know, a, a swift moving river. It's, it's, very, very fluid when played well. And there's also this sense in, again, in Navajo culture of the kind of the group over the individual. Now, Mm -hmm. they have their stars, don't get me wrong, but there is this sense that you're supposed to keep that ball moving. And the crowd, I mean, and we're talking, you know, Chinle is a town of 3,500, and yet there'd be 5,000 on big winter nights for big games and the crowd will you know is extremely knowledgeable and it reminded me almost of an old Knicks crowd where you know they're 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 yelling at the kids to cut and to screen and to you know send everybody's play men and women grandmothers and grandfathers Mm -hmm. um so it's it's a it is a kind of a cultural and this is one last thing as as we alluded to earlier this is the peak i mean they hope some of the kids to go on to play college, but really res ball on the res is the peak. I mean, you're, there is no bigger thing in that sense. It is very much like football in Texas. Yeah. Or I, or I, you know, I was reminded when I, when I saw like the size of the, of the arena compared to the population of the town, when I was in Lincoln, Nebraska, and somebody said, you know, the stadium holds 90,000 people and it's full. And I'm like, well, what's the population of Lincoln? And I forget it, but it was like right around the, it was, they were comparable numbers. And, exactly. uh, yes. it, it is that degree of, um, it is that degree of passion. So, um, I, I don't think we want to, uh, do a plot spoiler. I mean, Suffice it to say that there's a coach who's been brought in, Raul Mendoza, who's himself Native American, not Navajo, although he's married to a Navajo. Uh, because of his history, he once won a state championship. They have aspirations of doing that. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's safe to say they, they have a good season. We'll leave it at that and let people read the book and, 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 and see how good. But he at one point, Mendoza at one point uses the term res ball as like a pejorative. He says like, you guys are playing res ball. You know, like, in other words, it's what? Too undisciplined or what? Too what undisciplined. It? Too much just running and gunning. So yeah. that the, you know, when it's, it's sort of, if you, if you will, ideally there's this tension, right? Between the speed and the quickness and then the, you know, the kind of the discipline, the, the, the no, you know, making that extra pass, playing really tough, gritty defense. Um, and that's a tension you'll see among all, with all of the good teams on the res, the coaches, you know, they kind of, on the one hand, they want to let, you know, and if you will, let the horses run. Um, but at the same time, keep, you know, keep pulling on the reins a bit. Um, mm-hmm. And, and that's, you know, that's, tough these are i mean it's a very different culture it's also these are teenagers you know and, and yes yeah. there's a certain universality to that so, so he's a leading character mendoza an interesting figure he had been a guidance counselor and it, you know it says something about the challenges of being a guidance counselor there and 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 about some of the social problems they have that at one point he says one of the things he's proudest of is that None of the kids on his watch committed suicide, right? That's that's a big problem. It's a very big problem. I mean, he coached on both the Apache and the Navajo. 
um, reservations and they're cousins. I mean, they're, if, if you will, I mean, both sort of linguistically and, you know, genetically. I mean, they're, they're Athabascan people. They came down from Canada before the whites arrived and in the Southwest. And he writes, and they both have very similar problems. I mean, it, it's, it was an interesting place to write a book because it's not, There's not the hopelessness that I've seen on some reservations. I mean, these are, these are their lands. You know, the Navajo, to their credit, I mean, it's a gigantic reservation. It's the size of West Virginia. It is, they're, they're, they live between their four, you know, spiritual mountains. Uh, they, you know, they observe their cultural Stuff they're very. I mean, the 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 pull of of religion and of kind of the non-material is enormous on these kids. At the same time, you know, they wrestle. This gets back to the question of suicide. I mean, they wrestle with all kinds of problems. From you know, I mean, what we know is drinking. I mean, is 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 a great um, you know really the greatest problem they face. But they're also, you know, there's unemployment. There's kind of what do you do when you get out of high school? Um, there's a sense of, you know, of, of your loyalty to culture and a sense that if you leave, you're in somehow being disloyal to culture. So there's all these things that play out. And it does lead to, I mean, among other things, a, you know, a relatively high suicide rate. Uh, you know, high rates of alcoholism. So, I mean, they, they're, there's a lot to wrestle with there. Mm-hmm. And he, yeah. and, and that coach wrestled with that probably more than, than most. I mean, he, he sought to wrestle with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a, there's a really um, arresting and, and I guess depressing scene in the book where you um, kind of befriend a guy named Cecil who had been himself a basketball player years ago, although I think he's in his 50s. Um, he sells jewelry. You buy some jewelry from him, a bracelet or something. It turns out that he takes the money and drinks so much that he freezes to death while walking home. And, and that is like, uh, it turns out freezing to death while drunk is kind of a thing, right? He's not it's- the first. It's very much a thing. I mean, every, every winter when you talk to the, you know, the state, the, the Navajo police, they say it's their greatest worry because a lot of people don't have cars. Uh, well, I mean, of course, if they're getting drunk, anyway, drunk driving is also another big source of, of death right, there. Right. But they, yes, people just simply fall out and, and in the high desert, and this is about six to 7,000 feet above sea level. Uh, in winter, you know, it gets down, it'll go from 55 during the day to 15 or 10 at night. And right, the Cecil, mm-hmm. who, yeah, kind of befriended me. Um, I mean, he just fell out actually within walking distance of his home and he didn't get up. And, you know, in a relatively short period of time, he froze to death. Mm. So, um, now, I don't think we've said this is in northern Arizona. It's in Arizona. I don't think we've actually said it's in northern Arizona. Is that right? Yeah, it's in the Four Corners region. So the it, it sprawls across no, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and southern Utah. And it's about where I was, was about two and a half hours drive just to get off the reservation if I was heading in, in mm-hmm. south, which was the quickest way to get off. Um, and it's it's very isolated. I mean, it it is... You know, it's high desert and mountains, uh, some forest. I mean, it's a spectacularly beautiful place to live for five months, but it is very isolated. And then I gathered there's basically a series of kind of isolated towns. And uh, are they, or at least distinct towns, are they are they socioeconomically kind of uniform? I mean, you... You know, you there, there a lot. A lot of people seem to live in like you know trailer. You know, they're kind of you, you get a kind of a not quite a trailer park vibe. But uh, is that is that kind of a uniform thing? I mean, these are yes, relatively yes. low income towns all across the board. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's a, a couple Chinle because it's a sort of a government center. So there's a hospital there. There's a bunch of schools. So that leads to kind of a more middle class. Existence, though, even there, many of the people live in 
trailers. Um, and when, I mean, a thousand years ago, my wife worked as a midwife out on that reservation. We lived there at that time. It was in a trailer also. Um, and yes, I mean, I would say even those who live, um, who make a good living. And of course, if you're a school teacher, if you're a school official, you're going to make a pretty good living and it's, and there's not a whole lot to spend your money on there. Um, but even there, the houses are pretty, you know, pretty humble, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then there's, you know, this, there is an enormous, it's, as I said, it's the size of West Virginia and there's about 160,000 Navajo on the reservation. So there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of space, mm -hmm. and there are, there are a lot of references in in your book to kind of the austere beauty of the place. I mean, you found it very arresting, and I guess it's an important part of the context of their lives. Oh, I think it is. I mean, they there again. There is this very spiritual, um, you know, kind of connection um, that people feel to that land and walking, you know, going for walks in canyons, getting off into the woods. Um, it's interesting. They would, a lot of them would talk about, you know, getting the cowboy and they would, and they view cowboy as, you know, that's a native thing. Don't tell them that's a, you know, that's not a Anglo thing. That's a native thing. Um, that's very important to them. And people live very, remotely so you'll have 3500 in chinley but you, you know all often in fact you'll you really only see it at night you'll be coming back from a game and you'll all of a sudden what had looked on the way up is a completely depopulated landscape you'll see all these little lights and that's these hogans these traditional structures or you know a, a mobile home or whatever and way way off in the you know in the middle of nowhere um, and, and that kind of connection to the land is still a very important and positive part of that culture. Mm -hmm. So you've mentioned the uh, religion. So I gather a lot of them, on the one hand, are Christian, but they have retained elements of Native American religion, right? It seems yes. like. I guess, I guess syncretism is the formal term, but, but yes. talk about it's, that a it's little. It's very syncretic. I mean, so you have, it is interesting that way. So you'll, you'll, People will talk about going to a Mormon church or a Catholic church. Uh, Cecil, the man who died, um, I mean, he was both buried or, I'm sorry, he was celebrated in a Catholic church. He was then buried with a traditional ceremony. Uh, and they, and, and the, the native religion, uh, or, you know, is referred to as, I, I'm a traditional. People will say, I'm a traditional. And that means that you are, you embrace the, the natives. They don't call it, it's interesting, they won't call it a religion. It's just, you're a traditional. And that mm -hmm. means you accept the spiritual practices of, of, you know, native, <laughs> now I'm going to use the word native religion. And at the same time, then there's also the peyote church. And that also gets kind of wrapped in there. So you'll find people who are, say, Catholic, traditionals, and they'll go and do a peyote ceremony. So it's a, it's a which I unfortunately never got myself invited to. I just had been there just long enough. I mean, it takes a while. Uh, people are very friendly, but it's, you know, there's still, you're, you're an outsider. Um, but anyway, so yes, but all of that is extremely important to them. And, and they, um, the role of magic or, or the membrane between life and magic is very thin there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, people just take it for granted that, you know, you'll talk to, a deceased relative, you'll see something. And mm -hmm. um, anyway, and that, that made it um, also kind of made it fascinating to live there. Yeah. And, and of course, I mean, when, when there, are, when we see counterparts of that in, in kind of straight up American Christianity, we don't call it magic, but I mean, there, there are, you know, I mean, for example, there are, um, 
there are rituals that the, some of the players do that we might think of as superstitious. Like on the one hand, they might be Christian. On the other hand, there's some, I don't know, some plant, some magic herb that they put, you know, there's th- th- something they do. You know, on the other hand, there are, uh, well, baseball players. I mean, they cross themselves. Yeah. They think that that, they think that that's going to make a difference. And, and I'm not saying it won't. I am totally non-judgmental in all of these matters. So I'm just I. saying, <laughs> I'm just saying to, 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 uh, somebody from outside, that would seem no different from thinking, you know, there's some ritual you do that's going to bring you good luck is what it looks like. Yes, I agree. And, and by the way, when I say magic, I don't say that in any pejorative sense. I mean, there, there is a, maybe non-material is, is, is a better word, but I mean, there's a, you know, they, they absolutely live with this. And, and I don't, you know, without getting, um, well, anyway, I, I saw no reason, frankly, to doubt them very often when they would talk about, you know, talking with a, you know, a relative who had passed or seeing, mm-hmm. you know, seeing some strange creature. Uh, you know, I mean, these are some cases, frankly, you know, I would I would double and triple and quadruple check Not because I'm, you know, I have no particular desire to, you know, sort of figure out whether they're telling me the truth. I just was fascinated by it. So I would, you know, some, if one of the young men told me about something and I was happening to talk to their father later, I would ask them about, you know, things that had been seen. And the stories were remarkably um, congruent. And, and I was interesting when I've talked to historians, a couple, there's a couple of historians who, Anglos, but who have spent much of their life um, you know, living in and among the Navajo. And they too kind of just talked about, you know, at some point, well, as one of them said, you know, it's like a, I think that it was a Navajo who had explained it to them and said, well, you know, think of it as like a shortwave radio and you're on one frequency and we're on another. Um, and mm-hmm. he said, I, you know, after a while, this is what he said to me, I, this is a story. And he said, I just didn't, I saw too much I couldn't explain. And he said, I saw, I just kind of, you accept it. And I guess mm-hmm. I wouldn't claim to have gone that far along, but you hear this stuff enough and it's in the proper context, proper context, loaded word, I guess, in the, in the context you prefer. Contextually, it, it is a, it's, it, it can be a great source of strength. I mean, it can be, you know, there's a downside to this, too, if kids feel that they have gotten, um, you know, kind of a pox put on them, a, you know, a curse. Um, it can be very scary. I mean, that, that same thing that is very kind of warm and fascinating can then become very terrifying. And so, so if they would have like a run of bad luck, they might interpret it that way. Like, yes. And would yes. the idea be that someone did that to them? Yes. Uh, or that somebody who doesn't like them actually successfully cursed them or something? Yes. That a, that a medicine man or a witch put a, yeah, essentially put a hex on them. Mm-hmm. Um, and they would, they worry, and that is, you know, that's why they would, you know, kind of wrap various herbs inside their, their shoes. So as you say, it's not a whole lot. I mean, every time I'm watching the World Series and it's felt like half the players get the first base and they point up towards yeah. you know, the sky at a god. So it's 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 not as if this is some quaint yeah. you know thing no. And, and then there's sec- secular superstition in baseball as well. You know, never you know, not stepping on the third base line yes. when you walk to the dugout or whatever, and then there are people who take that seriously. Um so but but this all coexists typically with Christian practice. I mean you go you go to church on Sunday but and you also do have this set of beliefs. Is some that- do, some don't, right? I mean, uh-huh. but but it is certainly not, it's not at all unusual to find people who would tell you, I'm a Christian um, and I'm a traditional. Mm-hmm. And if there's the right road man in town, I might go to a peyote ceremony. And in all of those kind of um, work syncretically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. At the same time, I gather there is a sense that allegiance to tradition is waning. I mean, you you say that some kids of this generation could not 
tell you which clans their parents belong to, whereas maybe 40 years ago, everyone would know what clans their parents belong to? Is that? Oh, I, yes, absolutely. And there you see, I mean, one of the, as I say, we lived there 25 years ago, my wife and I, just for a very, you know, a couple of months. At that time, you know, if you went to the supermarket, you heard nothing but Navajo. Um, you know, mm. everyone greeted you yate, which is, you know, the Navajo for hello. Now, you know, I would take my morning run down into the canyon and as often, no doubt, in part because I'm, I believe, an Anglo, uh, they would look at me and, you know, but they would say hello, right? And, and, and it, it's, so there is the waning of the language was quite striking just from 25 years ago. The religion also, right? I mean, there's, there's still, I would say, I don't know, geez, probably eight or nine of the 11, 11 kids on the team still considered themselves to be traditional, but what that meant to them and the extent to which that their knowledge would have matched, say, that of their father or their grandfather, there's an attenuation, there's a thinning of that. And that's a big concern on a reservation. I mean, among other things, the Navajo president, the president of the Navajo nation, is supposed to be fluent in Navajo. Well, that's a real problem because, you know, tw- anybody 30 and un- un- I shouldn't say anybody, many of those, a majority of those 30 and under are not fluent in Navajo anymore. They speak it, but it's kind of, you know, it's more like they understand when their grandparents speak it to them, mm-hmm. but they're not, they're not going to talk to each other in Navajo. And is this, this thing of being traditional, it is kind of binary. Like someone will tell you either I'm traditional or I'm not traditional. It's like you think of yourself as in one category or the other. Yes. Yes, very much so. And in fact, Kids would, and not just kids, when I would talk with adults, they would say, oh, so-and-so is a traditional, or I'm a traditional. But at the same time, as they say, not invariably, but, but and, and that, when, the longer I was there, I realized, well, you can be a traditional, and you can be a Christian. And it's interesting, the Catholics always very clever with this stuff. I mean, they, they maybe more than most, have it kind of incorporated um, a lot of the um, traditional aspects into their own religion. So they talk about, you know, walking the beauty way. The beauty way is a, a very important Navajo ceremony. So they kind of incorporated, you know, Jesus walked the beauty way. Their their church is in the shape of a hogan, uh, mm-hmm. which is this eight-sided um, uh, Navajo, you know, structure, enormously important in their religion, always facing towards the sun, where the sun comes up in the morning. So you have these, it's, it's, it's sort of wonderfully complicated, um, but they don't see it as conflict, right? I mean, it isn't like, oh, you're an imposter. What are you saying? You go to, cat, you know, I know you go mm-hmm. to the church. It's just, it's all, again, the membranes are, are very, per, uh, you know, easily, are very permeable. And and so being a traditional entails both ad- adherence, acceptance of what you could call the native religion or spirituality, and as well, uh, kind of more of an effort to stay in touch with the language, with the with with with, with the whole thing. Is that is that it? Yes, I mean the the the, the language with the ceremonies. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, when somebody dies, when a child turns um, thirteen, um, you know, a girl has what they call their canalda. Uh, ceremony where they spend, I'm going to get this wrong and, and hear from my Navajo friends, but, you know, four or five days in a uh, sleeping in a, in a um, Hogan and then takes a long morning run each day. Again, running being a big part of the, the spiritual thing there. People will, you'll see people running in the morning and they'll, they will run in the direction of the sun and then stop and do their prayers. And those are, traditional prayers that they're saying. And um, do you know, by the way, is this, uh, are the Navajo people among those who, uh, in olden days at least, uh, did the vision quest thing where I guess it was a male at a certain age would go out and and 
be alone for days on end and maybe fast and hope to be visited by a vision that would give him guidance for the rest of his life? You know, I believe, <laughs> again, we're, we're both going to hear from, no doubt, from uh, Navajo. You, you singer, more from me. Yes, yeah, <laughs> You right, more than I, me. <laughs> I think that I, my, my, my sense is that that's more of a Plains Indian aspect. Okay, yeah, you I mean, may be right. You may be right, yeah. But, I mean, look, going out, you know, sleeping in a canyon, sleeping in the mountains, I mean, that is an important part of Native cultures, period. Mm-hmm. You know, but there are, of course, differences within each, you know, within each tribe. And, and I think see- like, so even the, Na- like the Navajo and the Apache, they're cousins. They speak a language that's roughly, you know, it's roughly like, you know, like Latin languages, like right? French to Spanish or something. I mean, they, they understand, they even understand each other a bit, but they live very differently. The Navajo live uh, widely dispersed and, and a great emphasis on living on the you know, going up and spending time on mesa tops and buttes and this sort of thing. The Apache live pretty tightly, tightly uh, woven in, in towns with most of their uh, reservation really unpopulated. So there's, there are these, you know, differences even within, you know, cousins. Mm-hmm. And is there, I assume there's a correlation between on the one hand, whether you consider yourself a traditional and on the other hand, whether you plan to leave the reservation when you're an adult. Yes. And, and, and that, you know, they refer to Phoenix as the second, the second res because there's about 40 or 50,000 Navajo who live down in Phoenix. Um, But it's, you know, it's a real struggle. I mean, there were some very, you know, I mean, I wouldn't say it, it can be looked down upon to leave the reservation, even if, you know, it's, you're leaving for the best of reasons, right? I mean, you know, there, there are a lot of them are in home buildings. So clearly they go to Vegas, they go to Phoenix, they go to Albuquerque and they work, you know, often making very good money. Um, but then, and then they'll send money back to the reservation. Very often if they get married, the woman will stay on the, um, the res, the guy will go off and do this work. And that leads to all kinds of strains on, you know, on families and family disintegration. And that also becomes a worry. And, and there's a number of Navajo will say, well, look, it would be easier <laughs> if you would just move, move your whole family, you know, wherever you go, don't worry about leaving the res, but that the pull of that reservation um, you know, and the kind of the, the, the role it plays in their identity, their their sense of self is so yeah. powerful. And it's it's difficult to kind of untangle. And I know that I would talk to a couple of excellent teachers at the high school, and they would a couple of them taught one of them taught AP English. And he was telling me, you know, he really encourages those kids, you know, get off, you know, go get a good education. Uh, even if you're gonna come back. So, As he said, he said, you know, I say that, but he said, I know if they go, if a kid and and there are kids every year for that high school to go to Ivy League schools, um, you know, I mean, the very creme de la creme of those kids, they're talented, you know, more than they're talented 10th, they're talented 20th, would go to these schools. Many of them won't, not all, but many will not return because Mm -hmm. simply there's going to be more opportunity. Isn't to say they won't have a relationship with the reservation. Isn't to say they won't come back to visit. But there's just not, you know, there's not a whole lot to do there. And there are a lot of significant social problems. Yeah. The the year you were there, the valedictorian uh, wound up going to Harvard, right? Yes. Yeah. I just visited him. Oh really? Yeah. How's he? How's he doing? Is he a what? Is he a freshman or a sophomore? He's a sophomore now, and uh, yeah, he's doing great. I mean, he's. You know, he struggled with it at first. He, yeah. and, and he said, you know, the first year was really tough and you'd start to realize, you know, you've, but I don't know that's, well, anyway, I'm sh- I'm sure it's small town kids would have the same problem. It's more so if you come from the, the, it's just such a different culture. But it sounds like now, I mean, he's, you know, he wants to be a humanities major and as a humanities major, I was encouraging that. And, um, 
and and he seems like he's you know that he's he seems to have done well. Mm -hmm. So, I guess it's not possible to generalize on about the extent to which being a traditional helps you cope with the social problems we've alluded to and maybe escape escape them to some extent or, or escape their their pull. I think if you're if you're strongly knit. I mean, that's probably true, though. When I think about it, it's probably true if you're strongly knit into a Christian church, right? But certainly, if you're strongly knit into a traditional culture, yeah, I've got to think it helps. I mean, I've got to think it helps a kid deal with that. But the problem is, I mean, there were a number of – because when I was out there, I spent one season, but I had done a couple of articles on this for the Times in the previous season. So I had, there were some kids who had already graduated and they would talk and a couple of them came back. You know, they tried Phoenix, they tried Flagstaff, they'd come back and they just talk like there's, you know, there's kind of no job for them. Like once you've cleaned the 20th yard for somebody, you know, and you get it for a little pocket change, it's kind of like, what do you do? I mean, you know, if you don't have a college degree, so you can't become a teacher, you can't become a nurse. Um, and the lure in particular of drinking is, is incredibly strong. So, you know, I mean, and that, that's, that's the great kind of bet noir. That is the, the great thing. Mm. That so I mean, alcohol is technically illegal there or, um, technically it, it's illegal, but in fact, yeah. it's, it's easy to find. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've, uh, we've talked a lot about here things other than basketball. I don't want to, and, and I think in some ways we're giving people a misleading sense of the texture of the book, at least, uh, because all of this is very finely interwoven with the story of the basketball team, uh, which I think will be of interest both to basketball fans and people who aren't particularly, but naturally get caught up in the drama of the, and the personal interest of the team dynamics and everything. And, and one reason we haven't said more about the basketball is again, I don't want to like do a plot spoiler and tell too much about the story of the actual season, but let's talk a little more about that. I mean, this is a real, the basketball is a real source of meaning to these kids, right? Oh yeah. I mean, and, and, and it is again, the return to, to, to return to your, you know, kind of analogizing it to Texas football. I mean, it is, there's no bigger thing you can do on that reservation when you're in high school. No bigger sport that you can play than basketball. I mean, it is, it truly is the, the one sport that knits kind of everyone together. These kids, um, I mean, they, they, they feel great pressure. In fact, there's a couple of kids each year who drop off of the team because I just think they're not, you know, they're not up for the amount of pressure and the parents, the grandparents, the, the cousins, I mean, they're tough. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll scream and yell at kids on the court. They'll get on the, the coach. I mean, they'll get right in the face of the coach and say, why aren't you playing my kid? There was one game, a girl's game and the girls are also, terrific players um, where in the middle of a game, a father, you know, came walking all the way down out of the stands and started screaming at the coach, like as the game is going on, because his daughter had not, you know, he thought gotten enough playing time. Um, and so in that sense, I guess, you know, you could say, Oh, well, that's any, any suburb in America, but it's really not. It's, there's a level of intensity and because the peak is high school, there ain't nothing to look for in basketball terms to look mm -hmm. for with your kid. Oh, my kid will, you know, he'll get out at least, you know, play next year at St. Joe's or whatever that, you know, whatever it is. I mean, this is it. And, and so much of kind of, it is of, of, of kind of face and of, you know, the whole family kind of, I mean, families will talk of being dishonored because, you know, they traveled, three, four hours, you know, some of their cousins to see these games. And my kid, you know, only got in for 18 minutes. Um, so there's, a, I mean, it's, it's, an, it's an intense, tense time. And the kids feel that. I mean, they're very mm -hmm. aware of that. Um, yeah. And if they, 
if they're part of a successful team, they acquire a stature that will live on beyond their high school years, right? I mean, it's, oh, that, it's that serious. Yes. Oh, no. I mean, there was one guy uh, I got talking with who had been a – he's a FedEx driver now. And he said, you know, he had been on a semi – what did they – gone to the semifinals, like, you know, whatever, 15 years ago. And he said literally he will be driving across the res and all of a sudden a car will stop beep, start beeping at him and he'll pull <laughs> over and they'll want to take a picture of him because they remember him. So this is the state semifinals, right? State semifinals, right. Right, right. Which is, uh, which is you know, quite something. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, no, it is. And, and when a team goes, makes the semis, they go to Phoenix and there will be – I mean, it, you know, it's like a wagon train. I mean, there will be hundreds and hundreds of cars going yeah. down, you know, in a line down to Phoenix to watch the kids play. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, if you make it to the finals, you can expect to see, you know, 10,000 Navajos uh, yeah. at the big arena down there. Yeah. And, of course, it's a cliche to talk about, the kind, the intensity, the bonding that can happen on a team, but it's true. I, you know, I was in San Antonio a year and a half ago, and the only two high school classmates I looked up were guys on the basketball team. I, and it wasn't even a particularly good team. I wasn't a particularly good player. It's still uh, going through it is intense, and, and you know, you can get some of that in pickup ball. That that's one of the great things about pickup ball. You're on, you know, whoever happens to be on your team may be totally unlike you culturally. But there's a there's a very strong affinity, especially if you guys win, you know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, that's I mean, that's that is a great joy of it. And and that's what these kids clearly feel that. I mean, I've been struck by what it's now, you know, a year and a half after after most of them graduated. And, you know, they're all still, you know, in pretty close touch with each other. They, I mean, this was a great bond and, mm-hmm. and they will, um, you know, they're still known, well known on the reservation. Um, and it's a, you know, it to be well known on that reservation. I mean, that's a big place. So, yeah. Huh. So, um, so you are in touch. So, so there, are, I was going to ask, it must've been, uh, I mean, I imagined it being kind of poignant, to say goodbye because I thought, uh, you know, at the end of the book, uh, I mean, uh, the, um, because given the setting, it's not crazy to speculate that some of them, things won't work out well for some of them, given the, the forces working against them. That's absolutely um, right. Yeah. But you, it sounds like you've kept in touch and so far things are mainly going okay for most of them or what? I hope so. There's a, there's a couple um, that, you know, where I know I, I ask the coach about it whenever I, I give him a call or, or email him. And there's a couple that, that I, you know, were already drinking um, and, you know, didn't go on to anything, didn't leave the res, um, are kind of doing odd jobs, construction and that kind of stuff. And no, there's a couple there's definitely a couple that I worry about a lot and, mm-hmm. and I would not be at all surprised if they have, you know, real problems. There are some kids who have done, you know, very done well for themselves, but even those, you know, those who have you know, a couple of just great young guys, um, but who left the reservation, they did, you know, they left the reservation. They went down to Arizona state um, or they went to Albuquerque and, you know, it's still, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, they, I, one kid got a full scholarship, but I remember it somewhere halfway through his freshman year, he suddenly panicked because he realized, I forget what it was. Maybe he didn't realize that he had to figure out like budgeting for something or another. And there's kind of no, you know, he had no context. I mean, he had no parents who had ever done this before. Um, and he's still, and that's a, a good thing and a challenge. He's still profoundly a Navajo, you know, and, and that's sometimes not an easy thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I had said I would, uh, 
I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of you as a sports writer. We don't have a ton of time left. I would like to do a little of that. But first, is there anything else you want to say about the book? Um, it's really, really, a, a really interesting. A great way to, you know, it's it's part anthropology uh, and uh, and, I, and I think not only for basketball fans, although uh, they might particularly enjoy it. Um, I hope so. I thought that that no, I mean, I tried to write both. I mean, not just for you know because not actually for, at all for marketing reasons, but simply because it interested me. I was interested in the history, the culture. Mm-hmm. You know, those, you know, who kind of organize and fight back against, you know, depredations. And there are many of them on that reservation. Um, and I tried to kind of, you know, do the do the weave, if you will. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I just it, it's I mean, it's a it's a place that very much stays with me to this, you know, to this day. I mean, I. I I look forward to getting back there, even, of course, as I, I'm very aware it's not my, you know, it's not my land, but it, it was um, it was a wonderful place to spend a half a year. No, that comes through. Your affection for the place and the people very much um, comes through. Uh, so just quickly about the sports writing biz, uh, you know, as I said, the, the, the book's a natural, it's kind of an extension of your voice as a columnist in the sense that your column is often about more than sports. Um, and I was thinking, you know, sports has become about more than sports, right? I mean, yes. I, I remember, uh, I mean, both, it's become more political, uh, although there were always things. I mean, Jackie Robinson was inherently political and, and so on. Uh, and it's become more overtly commercial. I remember I used to read sports biographies when I was a kid, and I remember I wish I could remember the name the baseball player. It was uh I was reading a biography about some baseball player, and <clears throat> this was in the forties or fifties, and he created a huge controversy by saying the following thing Baseball is a business. Right? And in those days, that like got him in trouble. Right. It's like, wait a second, this is sacrilege. Baseball is a sport and it's a this beautiful thing. Don't corrupt it by talking about this part of it. And now it's almost the opposite. If I came out and said baseball is not a business, people would be like, Are you you know, are right, you, you naive fool? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is does that does that part of it the degree of commercialization, which has a lot of dimensions, I mean, does that bother you to take the joy out of out of sports writing or anything i wouldn't say no i don't think so because i mean i I, i'm right i mean i'm fine with that i mean if 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 lebron or durant or whoever in the nba or you know jose altuve and with the houston astros has kind of cracked the code on both figuring out how to love and dominate a game and treat it as, you know, treat it as a business at the same time. Um, that's a, you know, I mean, that's a wonderful thing, you know, and, and, and more power to them and the Altuve, you know, family a hundred years from now will no doubt raise glasses of very good wine at Thanksgiving and, you know, thank your old great granddad, you know, for that, for treating it as a business. Um, and I think it's funny because, you know, one of the things that you would always hear, I guess, betraying perhaps our mutual age is that, you know, you used to hear, well, when, you know, when unionizing was really starting, think, oh, well, you know, it's going to it's going to ruin the game. You know, they're not going to they're not going to care. And in fact, it seems to me I'm always struck by that. It's actually kind of the opposite, that the fact that they can make so much money at it, you know, doesn't take away their, in, you know, sort of insane competitiveness, their love of the game. I don't doubt when I'm interviewing, usually in a scrum of like 900, uh, you know, LeBron or, you know, Harden, that they love the game. Altuve, so, I mean, you know, start, you can just yeah. list all the names. I mean, they all love the game. They also see it as a way to make a great deal, um, you know, of money and it kind of gives them a, a power. Um, and, and so I, I don't know. I'm, I'm all, I'm 
fine with that. And I, and I don't, I think if anything, it's made it more, more competitive. I mean, you would hear in the old days, you know, well, so-and-so has just gone on a salary drive the last week of the season because, you know, they, they weren't making that much money. They wanted to, you know, get another contract. Then they'd go on the off season and they would work in a liquor store or whatever. I mean, that's fine. And I, I'm sure that there were still, you know, enormously driven athletes, but the fact that they're now getting, you know, sharing in the spoil strikes me as mm -hmm. in a really profound way as, as not only not hurting the competitiveness of the game, but actually making the game more competitive. Mm -hmm. There is one byproduct of, of this. Well, it's a byproduct specifically, I think of kind of of the financial empowerment of the players to some extent. Which is the fluidity of rosters, right? Yes. I mean, in the old day, Mickey Mantle was a Yankee all his life. Uh, it's reached extreme proportions in the NBA, which has become kind of a game of musical chairs each year. And it's just interesting because, um, I might not have thought <clears throat> that the, uh, that the allegiance of fans could survive that. It's like th there had been this myth that this is my, well, the, to use the word, um, <clears throat> To use the word tribe metaphorically, that, 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 you know, this is our tribe. This is the, this is the, the, the New York Yankees tribe. They, they, they will be committed, you know, to the cause for their whole lives and so on. Now it's become, uh, the opposite of that, but, but, uh, fans have quite a tolerance for that to a surprising extent. They do. Um, and actually, I'm kind of surprised by it too. And I'll admit, I mean, look, as a, the, you know, the, the, my, my inner fan, I mean, I was kind of rooting for, I don't know, Kawhi Leonard to stay in Toronto after he won the championship. Well, I was rooting for him to stay in San Antonio. Well, but yes. <laughs> although he had, he had become so thoroughly alienated at that point that it was like, it was like good riddance and it had gotten so weird. But I agree. The guy, the guy spends one year in Toronto, wins them a championship so long. I was kind of a, even a little surprised when I heard LeBron was going to leave Cleveland because I thought, man, what a great story he's got set up. He leaves. He's alienated his hometown. Yes. He kind of comes back and says, OK, you know, uh, and wins him a championship. I thought, man, uh, great story. But no, he, he goes to, well, L.A. or Hollywood, depending on how you want to look at the aspiration. Um, it, it's well, I guess we're, this is a little too much inside basketball we've gotten into, but it's I'm ambivalent m myself. I totally get it. I mean, look. Uh, these guys, uh, I mean, they're the lucky ones who get to make money for like 15 years in a professional sport. Yes. You know, in football, the average, the average career lasts like three or four years. And, and so I don't, I don't, uh, you know, I don't begrudge them, uh, getting, getting the most they can out of it, but it, I guess because I'm old school, it's it's always uh, I'm a little ambivalent about it. No, and I think a lot of fans are probably ambivalent. I mean, I don't, you know, it's hard to imagine. No, I think that is. Look, that is that is, if you will. I mean, that's the the the, the downside, the challenge of the commercialization of the sport. The other problem with the commercialization of the sport, just as a writer, is that it is. And one of the reasons, frankly, I love going, whether it's Navajo or somewhere else and talking to high school kids, is you just get, it is like covering national politics now, which is to say you're always watching kind of with your face pressed to the glass. You get no real access. You know, the, the, you know, there's a swarm of people. Locker rooms are not really locker rooms. They're just places where players kind of come out because they know that they're required to do their you know, six minutes with the press. You're saying at the, at the, you're saying at the college and pro level, at the high level college and the pro yes. level. Yeah. Yes. And it's just, it just makes it, you know, I mean, the things, I mean, I would love to sit down with, and I could, you know, probably list 15 or 20 athletes and, you know, really talk with them. And the chances to do that are just about, you know, I mean, they just don't exist. And that makes it ultimately you can make it very, very frustrating. And it reminded me really of, I've covered a lot of national politics. I mean, a lot of national politics, obviously the same thing. I mean, I, I rode the plane with, you know, Barack Obama in 08 for three months. And I think spoke with him for 18 minutes, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, and that just is not, just kind of not satisfying. Yeah. 
So I guess finally, there's a related issue at the college level. I mean, in general, you're, uh, you are, I, I would say, you're, you're like a union man, right? Your, your sympathies tend to be with the players. And so, uh, I, I, I'm sure you, uh, and you maybe wrote about this, but applauded this recent, uh, development in college sports where, uh, if, if the likeness of a player uh, is used commercially, they get a piece of the action now, yes, which is new. Yes. I'm and, all in which, favor of that. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, and I was going to ask you about the next step of like them getting just flat out paid, like colleges just it being a bidding war. Colleges can, you know, people talk about this. Uh, to my mind, that's a more problematic case in a way. Uh, but in a, in a way, my main question about it is, is, is the same thing I ask about sports at, at, at you know, in, in college, uh, the, the kind of, the kind of tribal paradigm is, is the idea that these people are in some sense students at this college, right? Yes. That, 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 that is something that was, you know, uh, maybe more consistently true in a deep sense. 70 years ago than it is today. I think for many fans, it's still part of the appeal. They really are going to this college I root for. Although in some cases, uh, frankly, it's a strained narrative, right? I mean, in these scandals, you know, these guys are like getting, they're getting tutors, they're going to fake classes, they're, you know, and, and, and they're, and, and, and they're not there for the degree. And, and now in basketball, uh, the, the stars often leave after one year and that's the plan and so on. But I'm just wondering, like, well, I'm wondering what your view is on the issue of paying players. I'm also wondering, like, would that finally be the straw that broke the camel's back? Like, I just – and I, I tend to think no. I tend to think fans would find a way to accommodate that and still think of these people right. as students. I, I think they would have to probably – they'd still have to remain ostensible students. But if, if right. they got some pay – I mean, look, I, am, I acknowledge there's, like, all kinds of problems, right? Because, you know, you could see paying – Co- you know, college football, baseball, basketball, probably of you know, and, and women as well as men. I don't know. It gets tougher when you have a badminton team, or you know, where already they're running at a you know, they're, they're, it's yeah. not a money maker, right? It's a money loser. And do you pay those? And how do you pay a swimmer? Oh, do you pay a swimmer. I, I had assumed it would be a straight up. I had assumed it would be a straight up calculation. Like, what sports are we making money off of? Uh, unless right. there was some constraint placed on them by the NCAA, that's what they do. I think. Right. No, I, I assume it would be something like that. I mean, look, I think it's really a the problem with existing. Right. So you know, a Duke fan will say, "Well, you know, Kyrie Irving played there." Well, I mean, frankly. I remember it was a couple months ago. I had forgotten that Kyrie had ever been at Duke, you know, because he was there. I mean, you have to realize, like, as you know, for these, for the big players, it means they are there for one semester. They have to remain eligible through their fall semester. The NCAA finals, if they go to them, are in March, which means that, that, that really you don't even have to remain academically viable you know, given that you're on vacation through January, maybe you have to remain viable for like two more weeks. And then most of them will immediately drop out of school. That is the top players immediately drop out of school, hire an agent, hire a trainer and go to work getting ready for the, what they call the combines, right? The drafts. So that it's a, it's a preposterous. And then there was actually another thought is there was a trial that I attended last year that was just preposterous that word again um where they were where the the u.s attorney had you know with great fanfare said you know we're going after this cesspool of college sports who did they indict they indicted a bunch of you know low level you know assistant coaches they didn't get a single coach they didn't get a single main coach because of course they surround themselves like a mafia Mm -hmm. don does you know with all kinds of hanger-ons they went after these really low level guys And in the course of talking to one of the attorneys or one of these low-level hustlers who kind of connects all players with coaches, he mentioned, I guess I program I should not mention, but there was a a player who at the end of his freshman year gets an offer to go to Europe. 
and, and, and the coach says, you know, fuck, what am I going to do? 50,000, they're going to pay him. So what are they going to pay him? He said, 40,000, I'll match it. <laughs> I just like, what are we talking about here? You know, I mean, yeah. so if you're going to match it, and, and I have no doubt that that coach, as they say, is not alone. There are many, many, many of those coaches at the, at the high end of D1 sports. So it's just, yeah. you know, it's sort of a joke. And I don't doubt that there are some athletes who actually are, are true, you know, athlete students. Um, so I, I, you know, but I think, mm. yes, coming up with some way in which we can acknowledge reality, which is that these guys are going to get paid, whether it's, University of Arizona paying those guys directly or their coach paying mm. them in, you know, under the table illegally. Mm. Okay. Well, you know, one, one great thing about this book is it's like a break from all this. <laughs> you know, I, you know what I mean? I mean, I mean, this is, this is like the innocence of sports resurrected, uh, you know, their, their motivation. And again, I agree with you. Look, all these, all these players who are involved in these various commercial calculations, you know, they love the game. That's how they, that's, that's why, why they became great. Um, but there is a kind of a, there is a kind of purity, uh, about the story you tell in the book. Um, that's really refreshing. It's a totally different set of stakes. I mean, there are material stakes in the sense of like, um, you know, what, uh, how many of these players will not get sucked under by kind of the dark forces on the, the, the reservation, the social pathologies, you know, and yes. drinking and so on. And, and, and their experience on the team may be determinative. You know, it may uh, have a lot to do, uh, with, with how they navigate that. So there are real stakes. Um, but they're not, uh, and they're not, they're not not material stakes, but they're not commercial stakes. That's and it's right. A, it, and, and it's a great it's a great story. Well, thanks. So congratulations. Good luck with the book. Thank you. Yeah, enjoy and, this. Uh, and and uh, thanks for taking the time. Oh, sure. Thank you. Okay. See ya.